You, you like, like jazz? jazz? Dead memes aside, The Mighty Bee was a show that came in and out of the cartoon zeitgeist faster than the lifespan of a queen honeybee. That's a fact. Look it up. Rounding up the end of the aughts and lightly touching the 2010s, the show may not have left a long-lasting impact as some other flash-in-the-pan short-lived shows during this era did. Much like A Hive of Bees, The Mighty Bee blended in well enough as to not stick out in both a good and bad way. Good because it felt like a Nicktoon, but bad as it didn't stand out with the special pizzazz to capture your attention over other other shows on the network. But personally, for some reason, The Mighty Bee did stick around in the deep recesses of my mind despite not remembering more than the show existed and the people behind the show's creation. So I figured today on our Why You Barely Remember series that I wanted to see why I, and maybe by extension you, barely remember this show. Originally premiering on Nickelodeon on April 26, 2008, The Mighty Bee was a light-hearted, offbeat series centered around the misadventures of nine and three quarters Bessie Higginbottom, a passionate and spirited member of Honey Bee Troop 828, yet I can only count to 827. Based in a colorful, exaggerated version of San Francisco, most of the episode's plots revolve around Bessie as she, with the help of her friends, family, and fellow troop members, did everything in her power to collect every badge in the Honey Bee Handbook to finally reach her full potential as the superhero, The Mighty Bee. Ah, now the title makes sense. While the show originally aired on Nickelodeon's flagship channel, it was later moved to Nicktoons in 2010 to complete its 40-episode two-season run. And we all know what the Nicktoons channel is heavily known for. Rest in peace, the fallen TV show souls. You may be gone but I'm sure I'll cover you at some point on this channel. The Mighty Bee was created through the combined efforts of three entertainment heavyweights. Cynthia True, who worked on the show as a writer, Eric Weiss, who served as the director of the show, and Amy Poehler, who not only wrote for the show, but also provided the voice of Bessie throughout the series. Poehler, as a long-respected icon of comedy, thanks to both her success on Parks and Recreation and her TV origins as a cast member on SNL, was a strong creative force behind the show, helping to shape its final concept and style. Pairing her comedic prowess with Weiss, a renowned renowned original member of SpongeBob SquarePants' production team who has been credited as being the driving force behind getting SpongeBob kicked off with his work on the pilot episode Help Wanted, and writing veteran True, who already had writing credits on such iconic cartoons as My Life as a Teenage Robot and The Fairly Odd Parents. The success of The Mighty Bee was more of an inevitability than anything, but compiling all this talent may not have been the inevitability they were all banking on. On paper, everything seems solid, but it always comes down to the execution. Throughout her badge-earning adventures, Bessie is aided by a cast of characters in her pursuit of becoming the Mighty Bee, including her mom, Hilary Higginbottom, who is always supportive of her daughter's pursuits despite having to balance the running of a busy cafe with her daughter's extracurriculars. Bessie's six-year-old brother, Ben, who desperately wishes to become Bessie's superhero sidekick one day, her best friend and dog, Happy, who despite his occasional critiques of Bessie is always there for her. And finally, Finger, Bessie's imaginary friend she drew on her index finger. Making up the main cast of fellow honeybees in Troop 828 with Bessie is Penny Lefkowitz, Bessie's absent-minded but well-meaning oldest friend, Portia Gibbons, the snooty rich daughter of the troop leader who often teases Bessie, and Portia's best friend who often joins in on the teasing of Bessie. This Mighty Bee, not the best time for you to go anywhere. We've still got more Mighty Bee after the break. The Mighty Bee is buzzing your way next, right here on Nicktoons. Through rewatching the show, it had all the makings of what made some of the other cartoons around this time and some from before it, but what I felt gave it those lackluster memories I had of it is just that, the same makings. Rather than improve in their own way with these tropes and concepts of cartoons past, it opted to play it safe and close to the hive with the inspirations around it. But I wouldn't say that makes it in any way a bad show. Drawing these inspirations in a crowded space should should give it that launch pad to be more unique and try and shine through. Especially since the show, like I said, had so much going for it leading up to it premiering. Not only eventually having one of the more expensive animation budgets at the time, it had been in the works for years prior with Nickelodeon's animation president Brown Johnson ecstatic to be working with such comedic talent. With the working title of Super Scout, a lot of those proposed ideas would still be implemented within the series. One of those major points touted is that Bessie is not at a boy crazy age or 
and mean towards other females, and was more focused on herself and her aspirations. Also basing Bessie off of a character Amy Poehler played when she was part of Second City and Upright Citizens Brigade, which were comedy groups based around improv. Going back to the animation quality as the show would have a more cleaner and look to it for its second season, it's not hard to see the heavily stylized look drawing inspiration from both Ren and Stimpy as well as My Life as a Teenage Robot without directly being the exact same look as those two shows. And critically, the show was something that seemed to have everything looking up and up, with positive reviews as well as being nominated for several awards in various animation fields. Heck, it even won a Daytime Emmy in 2009 for Outstanding Individual Achievement in Animation. But none of that matters. Seriously, you could have one of the most heavily critically praised shows of all time, best animation ever put into production, and the funniest comedic writing that'll have you belly laughing until you pass out. But if no one watches the show enough to hit the numbers that justify the network keeping it around, then again, none of that matters. It's bye bye over to the Nicktoons channel of obscurity you go. But did it have low viewership? Or were there other issues that led to the end of the show's lifespan? We'll circle back to this. It definitely tried hard to be a show that was liked, bringing energy that was quoted as similar to SpongeBob, but it didn't have that specific spunk, that overall attention-grabbing tenacity that keeps you coming back for more adventures. Now, a larger issue that loomed over the show, which is that it felt a little too one-dimensional, falling into the majority of the episodes having that cut-and-paste formula of doing something in the pursuit of earning a badge. Something Pokemon itself heavily focused on, but a large portion of that also mixed up the situations in between those moments. Now, what do Pokemon and the Mighty Bee really have in common? Not much. I, I don't know why I'm making this part of the point. I have to stop script writing at 4 a.m. Whatever. Back to the point. It would be few and far between that Bessie would focus her attention on anything other than earning badges. Like in the episode, Dang, It Feels Good to Be a Gamester, a reference to a song with a similar name by the Ghetto Boys, or in which the focus shifted away from the badges and more on the distraction of a video game. And while of course, as a scout, sure, the story focusing on earning badges isn't bad, or to be unexpected. It just lacked that distinct enough difference between each episode as to not be tired of the same concept. While overall, I didn't downright dislike the show, it has its moments of fun animation and hilarious writing, it didn't seem like a surprise to me why the show didn't become another flagship property that would carry the network further. Coming back to the whole viewership aspect, while over its few year run was dwindling a bit, going from a great 3.1 million viewers turning in for the first season Season, essentially the third highest viewed property behind the likes of Spongebob and Back at the Barnyard, to then having its second season completely pushed aside off to another channel to slowly end. Eric Weiss in late 2009 would cryptically post on Facebook a goodbye to the characters, even though there has been no public announcement of the show not continuing, which then started a concern for the future of the show. And more surprisingly than the people creating the show, like the writers and the animators not wanting this project to come to an end, I mean, who would want to wake up and not have their job the next day? But but the network themselves didn't want the show to cease existence either. While the real reason of the show met with its fate is not fully disclosed, as it rarely ever is, it was labeled as preventable, with some speculating Amy Poehler's busy schedule with a ton of movies and other shows she was a part of relegating working on The Mighty Bee in between everything else. Maybe one day the answer will be more clear as it seems for once, the network, Nickelodeon, may have believed in a property beyond an initial green light. I mean, literally this year, in 2021, it was announced that the the show would be airing reruns on Teen Nick's Nick Rewind programming block, giving it a second life on TV a decade after it ended its run originally. Still pulling in tens of thousands of viewers at weird airing times, mostly though in an effort to promote the show, or just the service in general, being available to now watch on Paramount+. Plus. On the physical media side of things, two DVD compilations were produced in 2009, We Got the Bee and Being Bessie Higginbottom. For me personally, I find the background of this show's start and end and extremely fascinating, especially seeing how much Nickelodeon, for once it seemed, believed in the property so much, and despite I'm sure many best efforts, could not keep the show alive beyond its two seasons. While I don't love the show, at the end of the day, I enjoyed my time with what the show had offered. Will it be something I want to revisit again and again for years to come? Uh, maybe not. But that's not to dissuade you from doing so and giving it a shot, or to directly disrespect the viewers of the show who really enjoyed it. And if you did, 
I am really happy that you do. One thing I love about doing this series is diving back into the shows and rediscovering a love I had for them or truly seeing why they are just barely remembered. And check out the playlist to see a bunch of other shows that possibly you barely remembered as well. And if you have some suggestions for me to look into and want to see eventually covered, feel free to let me know in the comments. Also, let me know your thoughts on The Mighty Bee. Was it your cup of tea with a dab of honey or was it not something sweet enough for your liking? I'm genuinely curious as most people I've brought this show up to while working on this video have either said it was something they moderately enjoyed or they completely were not into it whatsoever. Anyways, thank you so much for spending some time here today with me. Make sure to hit the like button and subscribe for more content like this. I'll be back soon with another video, but until then, later.